This is the BBC. For details of our complete range of programmes, go to bbcworldservice.com forward slash podcasts. Welcome to the latest global news, compiled in the early hours of Saturday the 6th of January. I'm Oliver Conway with a selection of highlights from across the BBC World Service. Coming up, the US calls on the UN Security Council to back protesters in Iran. Let there be no doubt whatsoever. The United States stands unapologetically with those in Iran who seek freedom for themselves, prosperity for their families, and dignity for their nation. But America is criticized by Russia and others for interfering in an internal Iranian matter. Also in the podcast. We have a special report from Yemen as our correspondent investigates how former President Ali Abdullah Saleh was killed. China announces plans to plant thousands of trees. The author of a book about the Trump administration, condemned as full of lies by the White House, hits back. And we'll hear about India's national obsession with quiz competitions. But first, more than a week after anti-government protests began in Iran, the US has been trying to boost international support for the anti-government demonstrators there, with an emergency meeting at the UN Security Council. The US ambassador, Nikki Haley, said America supported the Iranian people's right to protest and urged other nations to do the same. I call on all of my colleagues to join me in amplifying the message of the Iranian people. And I call on the government of Iran to stop censoring the voice of the people and to restore the access to the Internet. Because in the end, the Iranian people will determine their own destiny. And let there be no doubt whatsoever. The United States stands unapologetically with those in Iran who seek freedom for themselves, prosperity for their families, and dignity for their nation. However, Iranian officials have blamed the U.S. for instigating the demonstrations and, along with Russia, accused the Americans of abusing their power by calling for the U.N. meeting. Even France questioned the move, saying interference in Iran's affairs could be counterproductive. With more on the Security Council meeting, here's Barbara Platasha. Nikki Haley used the UN platform to warn Iran that the world was watching its response to the anti-government protests. She said the Iranian people were telling Tehran to stop taking their wealth and spending it on foreign fighters and proxy wars, amplifying the Trump administration's criticism of Iran's regional interventions. Her call for the emergency meeting took Security Council members by surprise, and she had to lobby against Russian opposition to get it. Moscow believes the protests are an internal issue, and it's not alone. Some European countries have also been cautious about raising the matter at the Council. Barbara Plett, Usher in Washington, D.C. Meanwhile, people across the northeastern United States are facing a record-breaking freeze just a day after a huge winter storm brought travel chaos to the region. Known as a bomb cyclone, it dumped snow as far south as Florida. On the coast of New England, giant waves and flooding added to the disruption. This family had to be rescued from their home in Massachusetts. It was just coming down and it was like up to my waist. I couldn't get back. It was scary and I wanted to get out. They came up to the front door and they, um, like, he put me over his shoulders and put me in the car. At least 19 deaths are being blamed on the extreme weather. Our correspondent in New York is Laura Trevelyan. Currently minus 17 degrees and I'm speaking to you from the ice skating ring at Bryant Park in Manhattan, which is why you can hear this uh, a rather jolly Frank Sinatra music as people are skating around. So some people taking advantage of the icy conditions and probably a day off work to enjoy what's going on. But very dangerous conditions, so much snow here. And in the wake of that storm, what's happening is because the storm brought in cold weather from the Arctic, we have sub-zero temperatures forecast for the next three days. So imagine uh, the race is on to move all the snow before it freezes and turns into something incredibly dangerous like black ice. Is this very unusual? Because the US, or that part of the US at least, is uh, used to, to cold weather, isn't it? I mean, it is, but not to prolonged amounts of cold weather like this. And it may be that by Monday, when the temperature is due to forecast, it's possible that we could have experienced one of the, in fact, the lowest period of low temperatures since records began in New York. We don't quite know if we're going to get there yet, but that's just to give you an idea of how bad it is. It's minus 40 tonight in parts of New England, and on Mount Washington in New Hampshire tonight, it's due to be minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. If you can imagine how cold that is, you will get frostbite within a minute. 
Uh, so uh, the mayor of Boston, where they saw historic flooding in the wake of this storm, is saying that this is due to the changing climate. And while there isn't a proven link, scientists are asking whether the fact that we have now warmer oceans with more moisture, whether that helps to intensify normal winter storms like this and, and help make them into these extraordinary events that we saw this past day. And briefly, when's it due to blow over? Well, uh, believe it or not, on Monday it's due to snow, which normally you'd think it was cold, but that does mean the temperatures are due to be warmer on Monday. Laura Trevelyan in New York City. The French president, Emmanuel Macron, has told his Turkish counterpart, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, that there's no chance of Turkey making progress in its effort to join the European Union. President Macron said there were differences over human rights after the Turkish government began purging suspected followers of a Muslim cleric it blames for a failed coup. However, President Erdogan said it was necessary to guard against journalists he described as gardeners of terror. Terror, kendi kendine oluşmuyor. terror doesn't form by itself. There are so-called gardeners of terror and terrorists. These gardeners are those people viewed as thinkers. They write in their newspapers, their columns, as if watering them. They are the ideologues who contribute to terrorism. And one day you find these people show up as a terrorist in front of you. With more on President Macron's comments from Paris, here's Hugh Schofield. President Macron said it was time to end the hypocrisy of pretending that there was any prospect of an advance in Turkey's membership talks with the EU. These have in effect been halted since the crackdown in Turkey following the attempted coup d'etat in 2016. But President Macron also said it was important to keep a close relationship with Ankara and that perhaps they should explore an option short of full EU membership, a partnership, as he described it, that would anchor the Turkish people in Europe. President Erdogan, for his part, said that Turkey was tired of constantly imploring to be admitted to the EU. Hugh Scofield there. The Chinese government has said it intends to massively increase the amount of forests in the country. About a fifth of China is covered by trees and the plans to boost that by just over 1%. Vincent Ni from the BBC Chinese service told my colleague Nula McGovern more. The Chinese government has vowed to increase the coverage of forest to 23 percent by 2020. It's basically like, you know, the entire area of island. So it's actually massive. And then I think the, you know, main objective is to reduce the pollution level in the country because China is really notoriously known for being very polluted in some, especially in the northern part of the country. But also, I think, you know, if China's pollution problem has been tackled, there will be a you know, wider implication to the entire world. You, we're also talking about Paris climate deal and President Trump, etc., etc. So China seems to be very determined in tackling this issue. A forest the size of Ireland is a big forest, but Ireland is not that big perhaps when it comes to other countries. So maybe for our global listeners, 84,431 square, square kilometres, about equivalent to the size of the state of Indiana. <laughs> <That's> that. <laughs> <laughs> to put it in a couple of regional contexts. But when I think of China, I often think about all these new cities that they're building, all these airports that seem to be going up so quickly. Mm, yes, I mean, this is a part of the urbanization drive, isn't it? But, you know, here's the problem. When China is trying to become more modern, to become, you know, more sophisticated in terms of technology and everything, for a long time, China's economic growth model is really based on labor-intensive industries. And nowadays, you know, China is getting richer and um, the Chinese people are more concerned about their health rather they're making more money. Vincent Nee from the BBC Chinese service. The education system in India is immensely demanding. It's not unheard of for some colleges to require a pass mark of 99%. So it's not surprising that India seems to have an obsession with knowledge. And that, in turn, has prompted a large number of quiz competitions. As Rahul Tandon reports from Kolkata, they're fiercely competitive and a growing business. Team 7, this is a route... We have blocked out certain names which are too well known. It's a cold winter's night here in Kolkata. You can see the pollution and the smog in the air. But no one's bothered about that here because they're taking part in one of this city's favorite activities, quizzing. There are hundreds of people here and it's very competitive because this is the city's oldest quiz. Let's go and speak to the man who set it up, Adam Sen. The quizzing was instituted here by the Anglo-Indian. So 
our quiz was better known as for Indian quiz. You, you mentioned that it was started by the Anglo-Indians. Is that where the tradition of quizzing came from? Did it come from the British? I think so. There was a gentleman, his name was Errol Kaupa, who was the president of the Dalhousie Institute. Then Mr. Neil O'Brien, he had just come back from UK, and where in UK they saw the pub quizzing. So we thought this is a good thing to start with. Jammu Tavi Express, they said, but that's not right. I don't need the places, I need the railway route. Can't wait very long. This is the Kangra Scenic Railway. Absolutely right. Is that light I have to say, I seem to be unable to answer any of these questions. It's really tough. Let's hope that it gets easier so I can get something right. Quizzing feeds into that competitive nature which is part of the culture of this country. Anil Vaswani takes part in competitions all the time. And he's known as one of the best quizzers in this city. It all started here in Kolkata, the love of quizzing, I think in the 50s and the 60s is where the whole thing began. Still very much alive even today in Kolkata, as you can see, there's tons of teams, a lot of young kids from very far off have come all the way to Calcutta just for this quiz. You will find there's a very dynamic quizzing scene now in Delhi, Bombay, Chennai, and all, a lot of other cities in India. What is it about quizzing that has made it such a part of this city's culture and other cities' culture in India as well? I think it's not just what you know, it's not about just putting stuff together. A good quiz is when you, when you don't have an answer straight out of a textbook. It's things that you've traveled and seen, it's things that you've eat, tasted, you've eaten or drunk, you've uh, experienced things, and then you just put it all together and just come back for it. So it's just the joy of being able to say, aha, I know exactly what you're talking about, and this is what it is. India's love of quizzes can be seen on television as well. The country's version of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, presented by Bollywood legend Amitabh Bachchan, is still one of the most popular programs on television. Muda Pateria, a business analyst based here in Kolkata, says quizzing is now big business. I think Calcutta, to that extent, has been very knowledge-driven, as distinct from other cities in this country, where which have been more, I would say, money-driven or perhaps even status-driven. Calcutta status derives from the fact that people have, they know more than you. There are certain companies that are actually making a living of structuring quizzes, going around and conducting quizzes and asking questions. Two teams have caught up. Shaukins are on 100, answering service on 60, give them a big hand. The quiz is hotting up and I'm still on zero points, I'm afraid to report. They're having a short break now, so let's go and speak to some of the contestants here. Why do they love quizzing so much, and why is it so popular here? This is an interactive kind of fun. We enjoy that. I think quizzing is just an extension of what we call Adda, which is where everybody sits around and talks about various things, and which is a very Calcutta-specific thing. Answering service, can you please step forward? This quiz has come to an end, and the prizes are being given out. None for me, I'm afraid. But with more and more quizzes taking place across India, it looks like I'm going to have plenty of opportunity to practice. Team which has come first. Shokins. What is it, Shokins? Rahul Tandon reporting. This is Global News, the most important stories and the best interviews and on-the-spot reporting from the BBC World Service. Each weekend you can hear a review of the week's main news stories and why they matter in the world this week. It's available to download from our website. Still to come in this podcast, it's all change at Tokyo's world-famous fish market. As it's the last year to have the auction at Tsukiji, I'm really happy that I won the first bid. More on that later. Now, it's been dismissed as full of lies by the White House, but the author of a new book about the Trump administration says he stands by everything he wrote. And he accused the president of being childlike. Michael Wolff spent much of last year in the West Wing researching his book, Fire and Fury. Mr Trump tweeted that he'd authorised zero access for Mr Wolff. Here's our North America editor, John Sopel. At midnight last night, in the midst of a polar vortex, people were queuing outside a Washington bookshop to lay their hands on fire and fury. Not quite Harry Potter, though if Donald Trump had the powers of the young wizard, he'd have made this book disappear. But he doesn't, and this damning portrait is now available for everyone to read. What I'm most looking forward to is seeing what we all know is going on just below the surface. I think I'm looking forward to imagining, like, oh, you know, who in that uh, White House has actually said this? I'm expecting 
the White House to be as absolutely dysfunctional as the leaks would make it seem. The picture it paints of life in the West Wing is unsparing. Allegations of marital strain, of tears and tantrums, of dysfunction and improvisation. And at the epicenter of every storm, Donald J. Trump. The author, Michael Wolff, speaking on NBC television, said there was one unifying theme. I will tell you the one description that, that everyone gave, everyone has in common. They all say he is like a child. And what they mean by that is he has an, a need for immediate gratification. It's all about him. And the gravest charge of all, Wolf alleges that a number of his unnamed sources told him the president was mentally unfit to remain in office, a charge that the president's spokeswoman has described as disgraceful and laughable. Trump supporters are renaming the book Fake and False, but Wolf is not backing down. He says he stands by every word. Perhaps the most remarkable thing about this is why, given the author's track record, did the president's staff allow him to become a semi-permanent resident in the inner sanctum of the West Wing for several months? The BBC North America editor, John Sopel. Saudi Arabia says it's intercepted a missile fired by Houthi rebels in Yemen, which it says proves that Iran is supplying the Houthis with rockets. The conflict in Yemen has seen the Saudis and Iranians back opposing sides. The situation has become even more complicated with the death of the former Yemeni president, Ali Abdullah Saleh. He had been allied to the Houthis but was killed after he changed sides and made overtures to the Saudis. Our correspondent Nawal al Magafi has been to the Yemeni capital, Sana'a, to see if his death marks a turning point. As we drive into Sana'a, it's clear that there's been a decisive shift in the balance of power, away from the Saudi coalition and to their bitter rivals. Iran. Last month, a battle took place in the capital that may have killed hopes for peace. Allies turned into enemies as Houthi rebels fought the forces of former President Ali Abdullah Saleh. I head to the compound where it took place. 14-year-old Urjawan greets me. She's wearing a bright red hijab, but last month she saw dark sights. They were firing across and into our house with rockets and with their AK-47s. It was the worst day of our lives. We were surrounded from all sides. The fighting eventually ended with the death of the former president. The Houthis imposed a complete media blackout. No one knew exactly what happened until now. The BBC has obtained exclusive footage showing for the first time the battle that changed the course of Yemen's civil war. It shows Houthi soldiers surrounding Saleh's complex. They're fighting barefoot, chanting and waving their guns in the air. That was the sound of a Houthi tank blowing through the walls of the sprawling complex that for years was at the center of President Saleh's power. Suddenly, it's calm as news of Saleh's death spreads. That's it. The show is over. Saleh is dead. The Houthis have killed him. As the cameras enter the building, the aftermath of the battle is all around. On the ground are the bloodied corpses of Saleh's guards. Back on the streets, bedraggled men line up against the wall. Once loyal to President Saleh, now they're the prisoners of the Houthis. But not all of Saleh's men were captured. I leave the capital and head to Aden. There I meet a man who was one of Saleh's closest aides by his side just minutes before he died. We've changed his voice to protect his family. I was with him and he was defending his home, with his aides and nephews by his side. Three or four tanks surrounded his house. They began firing. I asked Saleh's former aide about Iranian support for the Houthis, long suspected but never proven. There are Iranians by their side and they tell them exactly what to do. I saw them with my own eyes. 
They give them weapons, but it's the information they give that is most important. I met the Iranian advisors when I was with Saleh. They were always beside the Houthi leaders. The death of Ali Abdullah Saleh has undoubtedly swung this proxy war in favor of the Iranians, who we now know, for the first time, are on the ground in Sana'a. It's left the Saudis down, but far from out. Meanwhile, Saleh's forces say they will return. The only certainty for the people of Yemen seems to be that their suffering will continue. Now, Al, Al Magafi in Yemen. No matter which bin you throw them in, very few of your cardboard coffee cups can be fully recycled. So to try to nudge coffee companies and their customers to do something about it, British politicians are proposing a so-called latte levy, a tax of about 35 US cents per single-use cup. The BBC's James Kumar Asami spoke to Mary Cray, an MP from the opposition Labour Party who chairs the UK's Parliament's Environmental Audit Committee. Britain has 20,000 coffee shops. Our appetite for coffee has grown over the last 20 years. We used to be a nation of tea drinkers. And we use 2.5 billion disposable coffee cups each year. That's enough to go around the planet five and a half times. Of those, half a million every day are littered. So they're ending up in our streets, harming our wildlife and polluting our seas. And this latte levy is really to educate customers about the nature of the product that they're consuming, to get them to bring their own cup into the store and to dispose of it sensibly. What should the coffee companies be doing? We want to see the cup manufacturers really having a race to the most sustainable cup. The problem with the coffee cups at the moment is that most people think that they are recyclable and they're putting them into the recycled bins where they then contaminate the rest of the recycling stream. So there's a double problem with these cups. They're printed with a recyclable loop on them so people think they are recyclable. We're saying they should be better labelling and saying not currently widely recycled or in-store recycling only. I guess people will be aware of certain chains saying if you bring your own cup in or you buy a, a recyclable cup, it's cheaper. But as you suggest, it hasn't made a great deal of difference to people's behaviour. Why has it been so difficult? We had a couple of coffee chains that came in. Most people aren't aware of the discount. And most people, the psychologist told us, respond better to a charge than a discount. That's human nature. We want to avoid the loss. Sticks rather than carrots. Absolutely. And we've seen that with the very successful 5p carrier bag charge that we've introduced. It reduced Britain's consumption of carrier bags by 83% in its first year. Are there, though, environmentally friendly alternatives? At the moment, you can get recyclable cups. The question is, can we produce it on a scale and in a quantity for the large coffee chains so that we're seeing the development of easier to recycle alternatives? We want properly recyclable cups. We want the cups that aren't recyclable collected in stores, and we want customers to buy fewer of them as well. Are you concerned, though, that essentially companies are going to push the charge onto their customers? It's the customers who will be paying for the fact that the companies haven't done enough in this sphere? The first first company that gets a fully recyclable cup and can drop this charge will be the one that wins the coffee race. So we've put them on notice, we've given them five years, but of course this becomes all the more important because China has said it's no longer going to take those half a million tonnes a year of contaminated waste. So the mixed plastic, the mixed paper, exactly these sorts of things that we were shipping off to China. So we either pay for it through the cup charge or we'll all be paying for it through higher charges when we're sending more of these cups to landfill and it stays there for 500 years when it's buried. We were trying to look globally at this and see if other countries have anything similar. Is there anything you're aware of? Ireland is certainly looking at introducing a coffee charge and we heard that France is mandating a 50% recyclable targets in all of its fast food cutlery, plates and cups. So that's really interesting because the other thing is we have to support the market for recycled materials. At the moment, if you're a manufacturer, it's cheaper to buy virgin plastic. So we're saying there should be a mandate of 50% recycled plastic in all new bottles. British MP Mary Cray on the proposal for a takeaway coffee tax to increase recycling. Tokyo's world-famous Tsukiji fish market has held its last pre-dawn New Year's auction before closing down for a relocation in October. It's considered an honour to buy the first bluefin tuna of the new year and the prices paid are as famous as the market itself. As Fahana Darwood reports. 
This year's winner of the famed New Year Tuna auction paid just over $320,000 for a giant 400-kilogram tuna. As it's the last year to have the auction at Tsukiji, I'm really happy that I won the first bid. The world's largest fish market opened in 1935 and handles seafood worth $14 million each day. But the antiquated facility is now being closed after concerns about its earthquake resistance, sanitation, fire safety and asbestos in its crumbling walls. Many businesses and people are attached to the Tsukiji brand as well as the location. I'm not interested in the record price. I want to have the best tuna from the auction, from the final New Year auction in the Tsukiji market. I'm really happy. The market will move from its central location to the site of a former gas plant. The vacated site near the upscale Ginza shopping district is earmarked as a logistic space for the 2020 Olympics. For Hannah Darwood reporting. And that's all from us for now, but an updated version of the Global News podcast will be available to download later. I'm Oliver Conway. Until next time, goodbye.